And as I began to get ready to preach, I came across an old story. You've heard this and heard this. You did this when you were in Sunday school, a little kid. You had your little crayons and you colored the little picture of this deal. But it very well may be you never got into the story. You never really lived the thing. And that's part of what I want to do with you this morning. I want you to get in here and live this story. Mark chapter 2. Mark chapter 2. Great story about four men with a paralyzed friend says that Jesus returned to Capernaum. That's up by the Sea of Galilee. He'd been doing tremendous miracles, and so the news of his arrival spread quickly throughout the city. And soon the house where he was staying was so packed with visitors that there wasn't room for a single person more, not even a married person more, and not even outside the door. They couldn't even get in. Weren't even close. Are you awake? Are you here? Huh? Okay. <laughs> You just get people come to church and they're brain dead. You know that? <laughs> well, I punched my ticket. I showed up, you know. And there they are. They can't get in. The place is packed inside, outside. But it says one thing about what Jesus was doing. And Jesus preached the word to them. I want you to keep one thing very, very straight in your mind. In this place, whether it's from this pulpit, I just talked to Mitch before we came in here. And I, I can tell, I can tell when he is excited. You, you don't have to say, Mitch, how do you feel? It's written all over him. He reads like an open book. He said, man, I want you to know something. We had a morning upstairs. Had a great time. He said, God is at work with this college and career crowd. Praise the Lord, he's supposed to be. Why? Because we are sharing the book and we're trying to share the book in a way that piques your interest, gets you excited about what this is all about and how this will work in your life. From little kids all the way up, we're doing one thing. We are preaching the book. The Word of God, it doesn't make any difference what I think. It makes a lot of importance what the Word of God says. It is settled forever in heaven. We will stand on the Word of God. And here's Jesus setting an example for us. He is preaching the Word to them. Now I think about this house being full of people, crammed to the walls. I, I think about the different kinds of people that were in there. Average, normal folks that just got excited because they knew Jesus had been healing a lot of people. Here he comes back to town. Man was run down there and they got their sick Uncle Louie and they're dragging him down there and doing all of this stuff, you know. They're getting folks in, in the place. But there are other folks that live it. The owner of the house is there. The wife of the owner is there. I think about the wife of the owner. You know, when you open your house and let a lot of people in it, you know what happens? They beat up your house. And especially if they're wall-to-wall -wall people. They're going to nick the furniture, scratch the paint. They're going to tear something up and say, oops, I'm sorry. And they broke that vase that's 200 years old that Grandma Grunt gave down the line, you know. And they say, I'm sorry. Big deal. You're sorry. My vase is broken. Can never be repaired. They tear up a house. All these people show up. I wonder if the owner of the house invited him in. He probably did. He probably wanted a little notoriety. I'll have Jesus come down to my house and, and we'll have a crowd. And boy, they had a crowd. You guys ever take anybody home without telling your wife? I used to do that a lot. You know, just kind of drive in, knock on, hey baby, I've got a couple of more for dinner. Never did go over big. Women like to plan all this stuff. They don't want to be surprised with all these wonderful extra guests for a meal. Here's the, here, the owner's there. His wife is there. There are, there are some onlookers, just people that are saying, I don't know, it's a big deal. It's a free show. I'm going to go down there and look at it. There were some disciples there, new disciples. Jesus just picked these guys. Four of these guys we know were commercial fishermen. And Jesus came along and said, follow me. And they left their business and followed Jesus. They are excited about what they're seeing. All this great stuff is happening. They are key in the whole operation. And then there's some certified Jewish religious leaders there. That's an interesting bunch. They're watching what's going on. They're really paying attention to Jesus. And then there's some friends of a sick guy. And then there's a sick guy himself. 
all this crowd that's there. And if you ever just stop long enough to think about all this group that's there and think about what was happening as Jesus was preaching the word, four men arrived carrying a paralyzed man on a stretcher and they couldn't get through to Jesus through the crowd. So those houses built with flat top roof, built with stairways on the outside, they just said, let's go. And they go whipping up the stairway get over there and you know I can just see one of them saying well it's a big deal we're, we're on the roof so big deal and the engineer in the group says no problem let's dig a hole right here and they start digging a hole right through that roof through the mud through the saplings you know this is a roof they did a lot of living on the roof up there so they had this wasn't just some little thin thing they had to dig through the poles that were going to hold up the mud and the tile and all that they dug through all that stuff and they weren't digging a little peephole you know they weren't digging a little thing say hey Jesus that's not what they're doing they're going to put a guy through this thing Jesus is preaching the word okay stuff is falling on the heads of the people all right and Jesus keeps right on going, and they finally, it took them a while to tear up a hole. Had to be three feet wide and six feet long. Had to be. They were going to let this guy through. And the engineer was absolutely right. When he got up there, he said, dig the hole right here, boys. And they let that guy down, and it says right here that they let him through the roof and lowered the sick man on his stretcher right down in front of Jesus. Boy, that neat. That old engineer is up there saying, wahoo, I told you guys, right there. Now, what is happening to the crowd while this is going on? Boy, I'd like to just bring you to the meeting. I'd like to get you where you stop reading words and start getting involved in what's happening here. I'd like to bring you out of the situation where you're a casual observer. I'd like to get you onto the palette of confrontation here to see what it would be like if you'd have been riding that sled down there in front of Jesus. Or if you'd have been one of the people in that place while all this is going on. And if you just put yourself into the story and see that Mark was working to establish two things here. One is he was working to establish that Jesus truly was the Messiah and had the power to forgive sins and the power to heal. That is a key factor we must deal with, people. The most important thing in your life will be whether or not you have considered who Jesus Christ is and have made the proper decision concerning him that he is the Messiah, the Son of God, the Savior of the world. That's key. No matter what other decisions you may make, they'll come and go. In eternity, they won't make that much difference. But the decision concerning who Jesus Christ is will make all the difference in the world. Mark wanted to establish this early in his gospel that Jesus is truly the Messiah. And secondly, we need the faith of the friends of the paralyzed man. We need that kind of faith and we need the healing which the paralyzed man received. We need those things in our lives. We need to be people of faith. I wonder who it is you identify in this crowd that's jammed in this room. With the certified religious leaders, probably not. You're not one of them now. You haven't been. You're probably not going to be. And you don't understand their thinking. Anyhow, with the housewife, maybe. With the owner. Think of the owner for a minute. You see some old buddy punching him in the ribs and saying, Hey, pal, who's got your insurance? What do you think? You're supposed to say this was an act of God because this happened at a religious meeting and ruled it out. They're not going to pay for it. You don't think about him, do you? See, we just read it and say, oh, this is a precious little story. Yes, they came in and tore up the roof in the middle of the meeting and they let the man down in front and Jesus spoke to him and they all went home. Isn't that great? That's the way we do when we open the Bible. I hope that somehow I can get you to a place where you'll say, I get to open the Bible and I'm going to read something and I'm going to turn my brain loose to think about what it was like to be there. Here they get this thing open and they lower him down front. And when Jesus saw how strongly the four guys on the roof believed that he would help their friend. Let me ask you a question. You think Jesus wants to help your friends? I'm going to answer it for you. No. 
I had a woman between services come in and tell me about her daughter and said, you know, my daughter just needs help so badly, but I don't think she's ever going to get it. I thought, honey, what are you doing here talking to me? Her, her daughter needs help, but I don't think she's ever going to receive help. And that's how we pray for them. Lord, I, I just know they need this help. I don't think they're ever going to get it. You better have some friends around you that believe God when you can't believe God. And these guys, Jesus saw how strongly they believed that he would help their friend. And he said to the sick man, oh boy, this is a deal. Listen to what Jesus said. He said to the sick man, son, your sins are forgiven. Now that isn't some deal. The guy's twisted up like a pretzel laying on this pallet. And Jesus is saying, your sins be forgiven. You know, I think about what went through his head. I wonder if he thought, thanks a lot. Here I am, Mr. Pretzel. And you're saying, son, your sins be forgiven. Or did you think about that? Or did you think, oh, isn't that precious? What did he think? Well, this, the whole thing switches immediately to the Jewish religious leaders who are sitting there watching this whole thing and they are thinking. You know the little deal in the funny paper and have the little blink, 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 blink and then a little thing up above the guy's head which shows there's something going on inside his head. He's thinking about, you know what that is, huh? Well, they had that back then only they didn't have funny paper. Same thing happened, see? They are thinking to themselves, what? This is blasphemy. Does Jesus think he is God? For only God can forgive sins. Very interesting. They had some understanding concerning God. They knew God could forgive sins. See, they were orthodox in what they believed. From a, a standpoint here in their head, it did not grip their being at all. Does this guy think he is God? God's the only one can forgive sins. And Jesus, he's reading these little, these little things above their head. Now, he didn't have a rag around his head, a little crystal ball, and doing all that and say, whoa, I see that. He just read people. You can read people in this day and age. If you're making a sales pitch, you know what's happening in the minds of the people that are listening. You know whether or not they're listening, whether or not they want to get in and buy what you're selling. You know what's happening. Jesus knew what was happening in their minds, and he said to them at once, why does this bother you? Boy, I love the way that Jesus operated. He got to the bottom line in a hurry. I like to do what he did. I like to get to the bottom line in a hurry. I was down Thursday. I had to go and do my duty as a citizen, go down to uh, be processed for jury duty. Hated it. Be there at 10 o'clock. And so I got there at 5 till 10. I was early. I want to make sure everything ran on time. It was 11.30 when they finally said, okay, go upstairs. So we go upstairs, and I, and I met a, a friend of mine, a fellow I've married a couple of his kids. He's been here half a dozen times or so. Every once in a while he shows up. And I, I met him. We sat up there for 45 minutes, and then the judge let us go to have lunch. Said be back at 1.30. And he and I went to lunch together. And, uh, you know, I'd been crabbing about having to go down there and spend that day and worrying there's going to be a lot more. And we went to lunch together. We had barely hit the chair at the lunch table, and this guy said to me, you know, I listen to a little country western. And he said, I was listening to a tune the other day that was talking about people going to hell. And he said, man, I got to thinking about how awful it's going to be for people who go to hell. I hadn't said a thing, folks. I'm just listening. And I listened to him talk a little more. He said, that's a terrible prospect. And I said, you're right. You know, it's like I didn't know this. He was going to tell me this new stuff. <laughs> and I said to him, let me tell you something, friend. I know you well enough to believe that somewhere along the way you have made a commitment to Jesus Christ in that you believe he is who he said he is and that you want to trust him. But I said, I'm going to tell you something. Bottom line. You haven't done a confounded thing to study the scriptures and get where you ought to be so you demonstrate your faith. Bottom line. That's what Jesus did. Bottom line person. Well, he said, I, I know I ought to go to church more. I said, I didn't say one word about church. 
I said, you need to study the scriptures to know what you say you believe so you can demonstrate to the people all around you that need to know Jesus that it's really important that they know him and you demonstrate it by your life. And I started selling Timothy program to him. And I sold all the way back to the room where we waited till 10 minutes after four when they finally seated a jury. And neither he nor I were picked for the jury. And they said, go downstairs and get your assignment. And when I got down there, they looked at me and they said, you may go. You're dismissed. We don't want you anymore. I said, glory, glory, there is a God. Praise the Lord. <laughs> and he came up there and they said to him, call in Wednesday night and we'll see what we want you to do. The next Wednesday he's got to call. And we walked across the street, went down the parking garage. Last thing he said to me, I want you to know, I'm really thinking about that Timothy deal. You see, it would have been easier to pass that thing off. People, God expects us to get to the bottom line with folks and get there in a hurry when they kick that door open. Jesus said to these guys, why does it bother you? Why does it bother you that I say, son, your sins are forgiven? And then Jesus said, I, the Messiah, have the authority on earth to forgive sins. But talk is cheap. Anybody can say that. So I'll prove it to you by healing this man. Now, people, I read this story and I, I about get a nosebleed. I get so excited. I think about being there. Can you imagine the tension in the room? There's this confrontation. Here are, these, here are these big Jewish religious leaders. Everybody knows who they are. Tell by the clothes they wear. They wore all the right stuff, did all the right things, make sure everybody knew who they were. They didn't travel incognito anywhere. And Jesus confronts them with the fact that he is the Messiah. He has the authority on earth to forgive sins. And then he takes the words right out of their mouth. Talk is cheap. Anybody can say that. I'll prove it to you by healing this man. There is tension in the room, friend. Nobody's yawning in this room. Nobody's looking at their watch and saying, I wish this meeting were over. Everybody said, what's going to happen now? And Jesus turns to the paralyzed man and says to him, pick up your stretcher and go on home for you are healed. Now, Mr. Pretzel is laying there, okay? He's laying there. He doesn't just kind of roll off that pallet saying, you know, Lord, it's been a long time since these old bones have walked. You know what scripture says? He jumped up. He took the stretcher, rolled that baby up, and pushed his way through the stunned onlookers. These are people who wouldn't let him in. And they just made a path for him to get out of there. That would be a little spooky, folks. Huh? Boy, we don't even think about that. If, if some guy came in here, twisted up like a pretzel, we hauled him up here in front, and I did a little deal and said, your sins are forgiven, you're healed. Get up, get out of here. And the guy jumped up and ran out. You'd be yelling, fake, fake, phony, phony. I saw that guy on the mall yesterday. He looked hale and hearty and good. You bound him all up and brought him in here. They used to do that stuff. This is no deal here, no phony deal at all. This is the real stuff. And then how they praise God, saying, we've never seen anything like this before. And we read this little story and say, ho-hum, what's the next chapter? I want to tell you three things. Just three things to let you go. I want to ask you this question. How do you answer Jesus' question? Which is easier? To forgive sins or to heal a man? Which is easier? People. There is only one place to go for forgiveness of our sins before God Almighty, and that is to God himself in the person of Jesus Christ. There isn't any other hope. We carry the only message to a world that is lost and doomed and dying. There isn't any other way. 
And there are an awful lot of believers that are ho-humming their way through life and they're half bored when they come to church. We're lucky to get them in the door. This place ought to be crammed to the walls three times on Sunday morning with people clamoring and saying, what are you going to do now, Buf? I'll start something on Saturday night. That's what I'll do. I'll find a way to do what needs to be done to get more people when you begin to get excited about your faith and say, this is the most important message in all the world. You get in some multi-level marketing thing and lose your mind running around grabbing everybody else and dragging them in telling them they need to get in this. This is a chance of a lifetime. You'll make all the money you ever thought you could ever make. You're going to be somebody. Ever get people that excited for Jesus, we would not know where to put them. And until the believers get that excited, until the believers begin to really believe that this is the most important thing I can do with my life, Jesus said three things. They saw three, three things. He saw, first of all, the spiritual needs are the greatest needs. That's why he talked to him about forgiveness first. See, Jesus saw sin as man's basic problem. Man's rebellion and his separation from God. The sins of attitude, the sins of neglect, the sins of pride. I'm going to ask you something, believer. Are you guilty of the sins of attitude, the sins of your neglect, the sin of pride? See, Jesus was never had his cage rattled by overt sins that were out. Were hey, they brought in that woman caught in the very act of adultery. They didn't shake him up. He began to talk to them about the sin of their pride, the sin of their attitude. He always got to the deeper stuff. Now, that doesn't he say, well, adultery is okay. That isn't what he said. But he got to the deeper stuff. So easy. Let me ask you this. At any point this week, did the Lord convict you of a friend that needed a helping hand from you. A phone call, a note, a drop by the house, uh, anything to touch his life, to touch that friend's life, and you were too busy because you just couldn't work it in your schedule. Did that happen to you this week? I'll bet money it did. See, the one person I trust is God the Holy Spirit. He is constantly at work, never takes a day off. Never takes a coffee break. Constantly at work in our lives, pushing us to do his work and his will. And we find ourselves so easily neglecting. Oh, I haven't got time. Sorry, I can't do that. I got a call this week. One of the guys in this church, his dad died of a heart attack. I talked to him on the phone. I tried to get with him. We could not get together. He was out of town during that time. The day of the funeral came. Nine o'clock service. Stevens and Bean. Al Cantor, our guy that helps us do our junior high thing from out of Fireball, was preaching the service. I'm on this jury thing at 10 o'clock. I know I can't stay for that service, but I know I need to see that man. I need to put my arms around him. I need to tell him I'm praying for him. I need to tell him that I love him. So I go down to that place at quarter of nine. Huge crowd. Inside is full, and it's 15 minutes till service. I'm out. There are more people outside than there are inside. A lot of times people don't think when they put together a service. And I know these people at Stevens and being their friends. I make friends out of people I do business with. Just kind to them and encourage them and compliment them and thank them. All the, all the good stuff that makes friends. And I went to them and I said, I need to see the family. I can't stay. I have to go to this jury duty thing, but, and they said, come here. And they started to look for a way to get me, the place was so jam packed. They said, come on. And they walked me right down the center aisle of that chapel, it's 15 minutes till service time, down the center aisle and over into the family room where I had my opportunity to be with that man. He was in the back row this morning, eight o'clock service. But I had a little time with him. It would have been easier to neglect him but if you make a plan, if God says, you need some time with that person, get some time. And I finished that time, and on my way downtown, stopped to see another one of our men. I just needed some time with him in his office. 
and then on downtown to do the work. How do you do that? You pay attention to what the Spirit of God says to you. That's what you do. And you follow the leading of the Spirit of God, and you don't suffer the sin of neglect. Secondly, Jesus knew the result of sin on total health and well-being. Now listen carefully to what I say, because if you hear half of this, you're going to go out of here saying I said something I didn't say, and that'll make you a liar. You wouldn't want that to happen. Many, not all, but many are ill emotionally and physically because of no forgiveness. Either they have been unable to grant forgiveness, or they've been unable to receive the forgiveness of God. That may be where you are this morning. In your inability to grant forgiveness... To someone who has sinned against you, you are harboring something, you are holding something, and it is penalizing you physically and emotionally. That may be what your problem is. Memories of past failures that are unresolved affect our physical bodies. Make no mistake about it. We need a cleansed memory and a clear conscience, and that's what God guarantees. I'll clean your memory. I will scrub that baby clean. I will give you a clear conscience. That's a gift from God because of his forgiveness. And thirdly, Jesus took sin seriously because he knew what it meant to his father and he knew what it cost him. He went all the way to Calvary. He hung on a cross and he cried out to his father, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? One reason, and he knew the answer to that. He was carrying our sins. Second Corinthians chapter 5, it says this. <clears throat> God took the sinless Christ and poured into him our sins. And at that moment, at that moment, Jesus was cut off from his father because of our sins. But then he did the other incredible thing. In exchange, he poured God's goodness into us. What a deal. What an incredible deal. And we ho hum our way through life when there is no other hope for people. We resist being pushed to the point to where we'll go and start talking about Jesus openly and freely. You see, when we get a look at 2 Corinthians 5 and those verses you're supposed to read this week, 17 to 21, oh, I pray that you study them and ask ourselves the question, which is easier? Forgiveness or healing? The right one always has to come first, and that's forgiveness. When forgiveness is accepted, the door is open for all kinds of other things to happen in our lives. Perhaps not the physical healing that we would like to have, but to know that eternally we're going to be all right with God and to know that he'll give us the grace to move through every situation here. That's his promise. And if we've got a cleansed mind and a clear conscience, life is worth living. I'm going to tell you what some of you need to do. You need to have the courage to put yourself on that pallet. Think about what it would have been like to be on that pallet. Maybe at the mercy of your four friends could have got you through there and the one said, let him go! Blunk! Didn't do that. He trusted him. You need to see yourself on a pallet laying there before the Lord, helpless. The pride that some of you carry is the very thing that keeps you from finding your place inside the family of God. Your unwillingness to say, yes, I'm a sinner and I need the forgiveness that only God can bring. You'd put yourself on the pallet and lay there before Jesus, paralyzed because you are, helpless because you are, hopeless because you are, without Jesus Christ. All of those things are true. And you need to put yourself there and simply say, 
I will receive the forgiveness of God Almighty for my sin. As believers, oh, I pray that we'll begin to see our spiritually needy friends needing to be put in front of Jesus. We do every kind of thing under the sun to try to give you opportunity. Summer nights, Timothy program, Sunday mornings, classes, good, strong teaching classes, great testimony classes, sharing people's lives, what God has done. We give every tool we can think of. Boy, I tell you, I sometimes think I'd like to get hold of a spiritual hot shot to go around and just get you off the dime. See, someday, folks, you're going to wake up. And it just might be that it'll be too late to wake up and go to work and do what God called you to do and do the privilege that 2 Corinthians 5 talks about. Bow with me. Father, it's been a good morning. Great opportunity to get into a story that is so loaded with truth. Every move, just incredible what went on in this thing. And Jesus, in his kind and confrontive manner, laid it out so neatly. Help us to wake up to that, Father, as we read 2 Corinthians 5, 17 to 21. This is the wonderful message you've given us to tell. Some of us continue to neglect those all around us. Say we believe it. We wouldn't be even stirred by an old country western tune that talked about People going to hell. God, I pray that we will listen to your spirit. There's some in this place that are laying on that pallet saying, Buf, I need to be saved. I need the forgiveness of God. I pray that as they fill out this yellow card, everybody's going to fill one out, that they'd write on there, I need to talk to somebody about Jesus in my life. Lord, we want to help people if they'll let us. And so I simply commit this congregation into your care, knowing that the Spirit of God will be vitally at work. I thank you for that. In Jesus' name, amen.